Hello, and welcome to this presentation where I'll be discussing some differences of pronunciation across varieties of English. I'm going to focus on a small number of features here, and I've, I've chosen them because they're of historical interest. Um, they illustrate the complex ways that ideology about language correctness and, and just regular old class bias, um, how those things play out in linguistic history. So I want to add this disclaimer. This discussion is highly selective. My intent is not to present any kind of comprehensive overview of how dialects of English in England or, or anywhere else, how they vary. I just want to talk about some cool examples that illustrate these broader processes um, and the sociolinguistics of sound change. The first feature I want to discuss is Rlessness. Um, this refers to the dropping of postvocalic R um, so, uh, vocalic is an adjective that linguists use to refer to vowels, right? So, vocalic means, uh, post-vocalic means it follows a vowel. Um, the R isn't dropped in all contexts, but rather only when it appears after a vowel. So, that's what we're talking about here. The phenomenon is also known as non-roticity. Rhotic is an adjective that means artful. So, we talk about rhotic dialects and non-rhotic dialects. Standard American English, for example, is a uh, rhotic dialect, whereas um, since we pronounce R in most cases, um, while standard British English is non-rhotic, right? And the, the root here, the R-H-O, rho, is the Greek word for R. That's why it's spelled that way. So let's look at how this phenomenon plays out. In a sentence like this, uh, park the car near the green garage, uh, we'd say it in American English, uh, of course there's several R's there. In a non rhotic or an Rless dialect, such as standard British English, it might sound like, like this, transcribed here, or uh, for my fake British pronunciation, park the car near the green garage. Notice that not every R is dropped, right? It's not dropped in green or in um, garage or garage, right? Those R's are kept. And the reason for this is that in those cases, the, the R sound appears before a vowel. And that context is one where R is maintained. This rule about pronouncing R when it's followed by a vowel applies across word boundaries as well. So consider this slightly different sentence, park the car in the green garage. Right? Notice that the R in car is now before a vowel in the preposition in. And so in this context, the R in car would be pronounced, right? So instead of uh, ka, as you get in the in the first sentence, ka nia. Uh, here it's car in. Uh, the r is pronounced before the vowel in in. Um, so technically, <coughs> technically the phenomenon is not the loss of postvocalic r, but rather, to be precise, we might call it the loss of non prevocalic r. In other words, the r is dropped except when it appears before a vowel. <coughs> that rule about pronouncing R at the ends of words um, when the next word starts with a vowel leads to a related phenomenon. This is called intrusive R, and in historical linguistics the word intrusive is used to describe a, a sound that was not there originally, right? It's not part of the etymology of the word. Um, this operates in situations like this. You have a, a phrase like the idea of it or, or saw a film. In American English, we'd say it that way. In these contexts, you might get something like idea, right? So the idea of it um, or saw a film, right? Um, so in a sense, an R is inserted when the next vowel begins with a vowel, right? Just like we saw in the phrase car in versus car near, so car in versus ka, nia. Um, the only difference is that in these words, idea and, and saw, um, they didn't originally end in an R sound. Notice that this still follows the general rules. We can illustrate with phrases like this. So you might have idea of it, um, uh, but in a phrase like the idea that or saw the film, you're going to not have an R there because the following word begins with a consonant, right? So the idea that, blah, 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 or uh, saw the film, right? So instead of saw a film, you get saw the film because it's appearing before a consonant instead of before a vowel. 
Arlessness plays a major role in distinguishing dialects of English around the world, and even, even within England. In these maps, which come from Peter Treadgill's book on English dialects, we see where R is pronounced and where it's dropped. Now, Treadgill uses the word arm as an example, so it's the variation between arm with an R and arm without the R. The map on the left shows the traditional dialect picture. This is based on research that was carried out in the middle of the 20th century, and it was uh, done surveying mostly older rural speakers, so it really represents a traditional regional or rural dialect picture. You can see that there's an area that runs down the eastern side of the country from Middleborough down to London. <coughs> this region is unmarked on the map to indicate that the R in AM is not pronounced there. There's a very large section of the southwest part of the country where that R in arm is pronounced, right? Um, you can see by marking the R there on the map. And there are smaller r regions in the north. Those areas that are marked with an R in parentheses uh, are ones where the pattern is more variable, right? You can contrast that traditional picture on the left with the more recent representation on the right, and this is based on, on later research. What you'll notice is that several previously variable or fully r regions of the north have gone completely R-less, and that large section of R-fullness in the southwest, um, that that section has retreated quite a bit, so the territory of R-fullness in the southwest is uh, much smaller. So the general pattern is that in the last century or so, R-lessness has continued to spread in England, and as we'll see, social factors have played a key role in these developments. We mentioned our listeners in our discussion of early modern English phonology since the drop in a bar has a long history. Um, it certainly began in uh, late in the Middle English period, but it was originally restricted to only certain phonological environments. So you might remember um, before an S sound, R was originally uh, dropped. That was the one of the early contexts where it was dropped. It went on for some time until eventually attracting attention as many things about language did um, in the late 19th century. <coughs> it was originally a feature associated with London in particular and maybe the southeastern part of England more generally. And crucially, this phenomenon of arlessness was found in all social classes originally. If you know anything about social class in England, you know that it's um, never a good thing for all social classes to do the same thing, particularly when it comes to language. And so there was a sort of tension between the fact that you had um, uh, upper class people and working class people um, using the same kind of pronunciation. So what happened is we see the construction of a kind of distinction, right? So <coughs> there was no actual difference in pronunciation, but they kind of constructed a difference in the way that they described it. And so they would often speak about the soft or smooth R when referring to how educated people spoke, uh, whereas when we we're talking about working class people, particularly the Cockneys, right, Cockney is the name for the traditional working class group in London, that they would say that they were dropping R, right? So it's a difference between dropping the R, which is what the working class people do, and pronouncing the R, but pronouncing it very softly or smoothly. That's what the upper class educated people do. You can see this um, quite clearly in this uh, quote from Walker writing at the beginning of the 19th century. He notes smooth R, right? That's that term. Smooth R is a vibration of the lower part of the tongue near the root against the inward region of the palate near the entrance of the throat in lard, bard, card, regard, etc. It is pronounced so much in the throat as to be little more than the middle or Italian ah lengthened. So lad, bad, cod, regard, right? So notice he's really stressing that there's still an R. It's so smooth that it's almost like a vowel, but there's still an R there, right? Because you don't want to be describing it as dropping the R. It's there. It's just you can't hear it. It's so smooth. Similarly, um, there's a lot of criticism about this. Here's a, someone criticizing um, the poet Keats, um, describing him as without learning enough to distinguish between the written language of Englishmen and the spoken jargon of Cockneys, right? And the particular criticism was some rhymes that Keats used, such as rhyming thorns with fawns and thoughts with thoughts, 
right? Of course, if you're Arliss, uh, those words rhyme perfectly well, uh, but it was offensive uh, to see them written on the page that way. Um, uh, that was seen as more like how Cockneys would pronounce them uh, as opposed to the written language of Englishmen where that R was pronounced, although so smoothly that you couldn't really hear it. Another pronunciation that's probably familiar to most Americans, even though we really don't have it, um, at least to the same degree in, in the United States, is this phenomenon known as H-dropping. H-dropping is exactly what you think it is, um, not pronouncing the H. So you have a phrase like high hill with two H's, and it might be pronounced as I ill. Historically, age dropping was very widespread, as you can see in this map, um, representing the traditional regional distribution of the phenomenon in England. Uh, again, this comes from Peter Trudgill. You notice that it's, it's um, very widespread across almost all of England, with the exception of the Northeast and East Anglia in the South. The entire country was traditionally age dropping territory. But to be, f to be fair, this is a little bit misleading since the feature tends to operate in terms of social class more than region. So um, even though it suggests that all of uh, this huge swath of England was, was age dropping, probably in any given area, um, not everyone was an age dropper. Um, it's based more on social class. <coughs> so a little history about um, age dropping. It's a phenomenon that's been around for quite a while. It may have begun as early as the 13th century um, we can find uh, evidence of this in um, usages like uh, Chaucer, for example. So Chaucer, um, uh, when writing in Canterbury Tales and elsewhere, he uses a phrase like um, mean homecoming, right? So to, you have to remember that the, the variation here between the determiner or the pronoun uh, meaning my or uh, here was you'd have two different forms. You had the form uh, me, uh, which became my, and the form mean, which became mine. Um, but in Chaucer's day, in Middle English, the form with the N appeared when the next word began with a vowel, right? And the form without the N was used when the next word began with a consonant. So if we have the word homecoming, home, uh, if we pronounce the H, there's a consonant there, and so we would expect to see me, homecoming. The fact that he writes mean with an N suggests that he didn't pronounce that H. So he would say mean homecoming, right? Something like that, right? The key is the H would be dropped and we get the evidence by looking at the form of the pronoun mean that comes before it. So it's been around for a long time, H dropping. Um, it doesn't really uh, draw much attention and much stigma uh, commentary until the 18th century. Again, the 18th century sort of when people became obsessed about these kinds of things. So it emerges as a shibboleth in that uh, time period. Shibboleth is a kind of fancy word um, that comes from an old biblical story, by the way. Uh, interesting etymology, if you're interested, uh, look that up. But shibboleth um, basically means a kind of word that serves as a, uh, as a, a mark of distinction, of, uh, in this case, of social class. And really, the stereotype um, came to be that this H-dropping pronunciation became associated with with working class people, um, in the case of London, with the Cockneys, right? So Cockneys were thought to say things like, give my horse some hoats, right? And so you can s actually see both sides of it here, right? You have H dropping in horse, and then you have uh, a sort of parallel um, intrusive H in words like oats, right? So if a, if a word begins with a vowel, um, if you're an H dropper, you might not know whether it, it has a vowel or has starts with an H, and so you might sort of randomly insert H's there. So you drop the H in horse, and you insert an intrusive H in oats. So you get horse and hoats. There's another example of that, a quote from 1842. There is no footman, right, a working class person, in all of St. James, who would give entrance to the man who should ask, I say, is your master in the house? Uh, no, not even if the fellow himself knew no better than to reply, no, he isn't. He's gone to Eygate. Right, so you can see again that mixing of dropping the H and, ran and the intrusive H. <coughs> it's clear that people in England have been concerned about age dropping for some time. Um, this is a, a interesting, uh, it's a little book or pamphlet that was designed to help people um, who were struck by this, this terrible affliction of, of not knowing when to pronounce 
um, H. Uh, so of course it's it's written by the Honorable Henry H. Um, and I think you you can if you can see the cover here, it's really quite lovely. There's a man uh, tipping his cap, following a lady, and the man is holding an H in his hand, and he says, "Please, ma'am, you've dropped something." That's adorable. This feature is one that figures prominently in popular conceptions of being well-mannered and especially of being ladylike, as you can see in this quote from a guide uh, for uh, training young ladies. The quote here, the, man, the manner of expressing yourself should be particularly attended to as well as your pronunciation. How would it sound at your own table if you, will s if you should say, will you take a little air instead of hair? Do you ride on horseback for horseback? Right. So it's interesting to see them particularly point out this feature of H dropping as one for someone to pay attention to. Taking it even further is the author of this quote from 1902. So important indeed is the question of the use of H's in England that no marriage should take place between persons whose ideas on the subject do not agree. In other words, we should not allow mixed marriages between people who drop the H and people who pronounce the H properly. Certainly no class bias intended in that. Turning now to a feature that's more relevant um, on both sides of the Atlantic, and this is G-dropping. It's another one that I'm sure you're familiar with. It refers to the use of, of the alveolar N instead of the velar ng at the ends of words, as in um, nothing is working instead of nothing is working with the ng sound uh, for the velar. <coughs> this is... Um, Another uh, feature that has kind of an interesting uh, history that we've discussed previously. Let's review that quickly. Um, so in Middle English, the sequence of N plus G, uh, uh, both of those letters had phonological value. So uh, NG would have been pronounced unga, right? Both the velar nasal and then the G uh, stop there, because traditionally the velar nasal was just an allophone of the phoneme N that appeared before velar sounds, velar stops. <coughs> this changed in early modern English, where um, the ung in, uh, uh, appears in stress syllables. So that sequence of sounds, the unga, the n plus the g, the g is dropped. And in stressed syllables, the uh, you just get the velar nasal. In unstressed syllables, however, the, um, the g is dropped, but the nasal reverts to an alveolar. Right. So this leads to a difference between a stressed syllable, like the word um, thing, where you'd get a velar nasal, and nothing, where you'd get a, um, a, a an alveolar nasal, because it's an unstressed syllable. That went on for quite a while. In fact, that final N was perfectly um, accepted, perfectly unstigmatized, standard even, um, for uh, centuries after this change happened in early modern English. You can see this in... Um, this uh, passage from uh, from Wordsworth, the poet, 1798, um, where you can see he's rhyming, rhyming traveling and javelin. Well, those words only rhyme if you pronounce traveling as traveling, right? So the fact that you have a um, well re well regarded, prestigious poet who's using the pronunciation traveling and rhyming it with javelin tells you that this was not a particularly stigmatized usage. Of course, that changed eventually. <coughs> and the final N pronunciation and a word like traveling or running or so forth, um, that began to attract stigma and became the object of criticism, as you can see in this assessment from 1823, where it's that pronunciation is seen as the mark of the careless, the thoughtless, and the half-educated from a uh, lovely titled book, The Vulgarities of Speech Corrected, a popular genre to help people. Um, so... People came to use the velar nasal as a kind of spelling pronunciation, as a kind of correction uh, for the perceived stigma associated with the uh, G-dropped uh, form, especially in this ing suffix, which is, of course, very common in present day English. Um, so this usage, um, running for running, is um, actually a much bigger deal in American English than it is in the UK. There's there's less stigma associated with that alveolar pronunciation, with saying walking and running and so forth. Um, in the UK, and it remains common even in the upper classes in England. Finally, we turn to something known as broad 
A. It's again one that we've encountered briefly in our earlier discussion of the history of English. Um, to recap the story of the short A vowel in English, um, so the vowel we're talking about here in Old English was an A sound, a low front vowel, A. In Middle English, that A was backed, and so it became an A sound. That was the regular development of that vowel. And then in Early Modern English, it went from A to back to an, an A, or rather front to an A. It reverted to an A there. So you have a word like uh, the demonstrative uh, Old English that becomes that in Middle English and then goes back to that in Early Modern English. But you might remember in some context, that is some instances of that A vowel where uh, the vowel was backed again to an A ah sound uh, there. And one of those, the one that we're talking about here, is uh, the change that happened in the 18th century where the A ah was backed to an A ah or an A ah in words like glass and half and dance. So phonetically what we're talking about here is the the typewriter A, that's a low central vowel, so something like uh, instead of glass, it might be glass. And then the other one is a full back vowel, uh, so something like gloss, right? And these are traditionally a little bit longer, that's why I put the colon after him. <coughs> so we're talking uh, about uh, glass in early modern English going to glass or gloss, again, uh, in the 18th century, in, of course, some dialects of English. As this developed, it was originally um, associated with the working class. So it was originally considered a vulgarism, right, associated with the uneducated people, um, particularly with the Cockneys, the working class population of London. Eventually, it spread up the social ladder. So people in the middle classes and upper classes started to use that. And then this sort of created a kind of judgment about the competing pronunciations. So I think it's kind of interesting that the um, older, that is the early modern English pronunciation with an a, ah, came to be can regarded as an affectation, as an affected pronunciation. You can see that in this quote here from 1798. I must venture to express my humble opinion that giving these words, uh, last, past, task, etc., the flat, dead sound of a ah, in lack, latch, pan, and etc., is encouraging a mincing modern affectation and departing from the chew, the genuine euphronical pronunciation of our language. Right? So, in other words, uh, if you say last and past and ask instead of lost and past and ask, that that's an affectation. And I just think that's amusing from an American perspective because, of course, if any American were to say lost and past and ask, that would definitely be an affectation, right? It's not the normal way of pronouncing it in American English. But here it's the a-like pronunciation that was considered an affectation in England. So a comes to be considered an affectation, and uh, what eventually happened is that they had to find a kind of um, a, a middle ground, right? They, they didn't want to go with a ah because that was affected, but on the other hand, they were concerned about the ah pronunciation because that was associated with working class people, right? So if you are educated, you can't say ah because you'll sound affected, and you can't say ah because you'll sound working class. Here's a quote that reflects that. Avoid um, a too broad or too slender pronunciation of the vowel a, ah, as in glass, pass, etc. Um, that is, you should avoid the extremes of affectation and vulgarity. Right. So if you say glass and pass, that's an affectation. If you say gloss and pass, that's a vulgarity. That's associated with working class people. Right. So you should sort of split the difference and go for something phonetically in the middle, something like. Uh, glass, glass with a long a, ah, or even glass with a uh, central vowel there. As you can imagine, it's kind of hard um, to phonetically plan out your vowels so precisely. Um, as it happens, by the end of the 19th century, that previously stigmatized form, ah, as in gloss and gross and so forth, um, that had become the prestige norm. So it was the one that even the upper classes accepted, along with, of course, the, the working classes.
However, they did come up with a way to preserve some of those class distinctions, which is something that's very important. They developed rather complex rules for when to use this broad A. Right? So, for example, in words like uh, uh, sample and plant, you get an A, ah, but in words like ample and rant, you get an A. Ah. Right? Just looking at those words and the sounds that are around them, you wouldn't really be able to predict that. Right? You wouldn't be able to predict uh, on phonological grounds whether any given word has an A ah or an A. Ah. That is, should be pronounced with an A ah or an A. Ah. So how do you know whether it should be sample or sample? Well, in order to know these kinds of things, you of course have to be raised in the right environments and you have to attend the right schools and all of that sort of thing. Right? You have to be enculturated into the prestigious accent. right? And that's the accent that's associated with political and cultural power in England. Um, so that's it. It preserves some of those class distinctions that were previously marked phonetically now they're marked sort of phonologically in terms of which words get which vowel. So this was just a small sample of pronunciation features that distinguish dialects of English in the UK and elsewhere. I selected these particular examples because they figure so prominently in differences along social class lines in England um, as they were constructed historically. Um, and in some cases, the pronunciation differences continue to pattern along those lines today. So thanks for listening.